Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our uh, final Dream Course talk of the semester. We're delighted to have uh, Professor Paul Edwards visiting us today. Um, he is director of the Program of Science, Technology, and Society at Stanford University. Um, and he uh, is the author of a book that students in this class will be familiar with, A Vast Machine, Computer Models, Climate Data, and the Politics of Global Warming. He's also the author of the book, The Closed World, Computers and the Politics of Discourse in Cold War America. And he is currently serving as a, one of the uh, lead authors for the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, so thanks very much for being here, Paul, and welcome. Thanks for having me. And uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I was just saying to your colleagues at Oklahoma that I, I really wish I could have come in person when it was scheduled. Uh, let me share my screen. And let's see, now I have to do some rearranging of windows so I can see you while I talk because that really helps me. And actually, if you know a few of you students would not mind turning on your video, that would help me too. So this cartoon is actually about what we're going to be talking about today. It's about time travel, and you know, partly I've I've uh, I was just thinking that. The great thing about what's this COVID crisis is that it has cut travel time by a lot. So it would have taken me a day to get to Oklahoma before, and now it only took me one minute to, and a couple of clicks. But you know, the point of the cartoon really is down here at the bottom. We better hurry. No, that's the great thing about this technology of time travel. And I, so I want to talk about time. I want to talk about risk. And I want to talk about what we know about the climate and put all of that into the perspective of the kinds of infrastructures that modern societies have built and really depend on. I have a fair number of slides here and I would like to go through all of them if I can, but I'm also uh, aware that people get tired of listening to talks on Zoom. So I've got some questions slides in here where you'll have a chance to no. Uh, ask questions at I any those point. Tabs. And then, um, hey guys, mute your mics. Um, to, to ask questions about anything I've said, and uh, we'll take a couple of minutes for that at several points during the talk. So what's the talk about? Um, it's about temporalities. And by that, I mean scales of time. Uh, infrastructure is a term that's been used a lot in science and technology studies. It generally refers to all the things that you're familiar with, like roads and trains and airplanes and the internet and sewer systems, things that are really important for us as humans, uh, especially in the developed world. We use, many people use them, even most people. They're generally reliable. and because of they're so reliable and often we just can't see them anymore. They become invisible to us until they break. They're also part of how we belong to the society that we live in. We know how the infrastructures work. So, excuse me. So I'm gonna talk about two kinds of risk the acute risks of punctual events, so like accidents, earthquakes, and fires, but mainly I'm gonna be talking about chronic risks, like the risk of climate change that build up gradually over time. And the risks don't just come from the climate system, but from the socio-technical systems that we've developed and the degree of their brittleness. And we're actually witnessing that right now with the COVID crisis that's a relatively punctual event. It won't last very long, a year or two at the most probably before we get a vaccine. Uh, maybe it'll be worse than that, but it's, you know, it's very bad. Uh, but it's very also of a relatively short duration. And even so, it's caused a dramatic disruption of the infrastructures that we live in, uh, particularly the economic system. The, with respect to the climate system, we're highly vulnerable to new kinds of normals that are emerging. 
So here's the plan for the talk. A little bit about time itself, how we measure it, the infrastructures we have for that, a little bit about what we know about the climate. And there I'm gonna do a kind of zoom lens approach from 800,000 year scale to the one year scale. Then a bit more about infrastructure. And uh, that finally, some things about climate risk and infrastructure time and the kinds of some of the risks that we have now generated that, are, that will last essentially forever with respect to human beings. So let's talk about time a little bit. You may not know that the hours were once a variable unit of time. They were 1 12th of the time be between sunup and sundown or between sundown and sunup. So as the year goes on, if you're at a high latitude, that uh, the, the, the length of an hour changes every day. So if you look at a sundial, it's, you know, at, during the summer, when there's a, the daylight period lasts longer, the hours also last longer. And during the winter, when there's much less light, they are much shorter. And this made a lot of sense for societies that were driven by the sun, where agriculture was the main activity. And in the summer, you would be doing a lot of work. And in the winter, you would mostly be trying to survive in the cold. So, in that system, time was measured by solar time, and the moment of noon was the moment when the sun crossed the zenith, the, the top of the, the apex of, the, of the, the sky. This instrument on the left is a transit observing tool that was used to see stars, but also the sun pass across that zenith point and mark the exact moment of noon. So lots of observatories like this Naval Observatory in Washington um, had these instruments and would measure the, uh, would note the exact moment of noon. Here we have a telegraph station in London at Charing Cross in the early 1850s. And I wanna point out a few things about this image. First, you have the office of the electric telegraph down here at the bottom. So, at this place, they would be receiving a time signal from an observatory that noted the moment of noon. It would be telegraphed to them and that would be, then be used to mark the, the time on this public clock outside. So people could come to the telegraph office and look at the public clock and use that to set their watches. Another way that they marked that moment was with this time ball. This was a very common instrument in, that existed all over the place, in, especially in port cities. It would be raised up this mast, and then at the moment of noon, it would be dropped so that you would see the ball fall and use that to set the chronometer for a sea vessel or uh, any, anybody else who was in view of that could use it to set their watch. So solar time was time in this period, but clocks had changed the structure of time so that hours were now a single unit and did not vary across the course of the day. But the moment of noon was still relative to local solar time. And what you see here is a chart of Europe with Dresden at the center. So when it's noon in Dresden, what time is it in Leipzig? Well, it's six minutes of noon. In London, it's five minutes before one and so on. So time depended still on marking that moment of noon and receiving a telegraph signal from the observatory that told you what it was. But the observatory would be on, the, the observatory you would use locally would be the one that was on a time band uh, uh, north or south of you and not east or west of you. So this system uh, went on for quite a while, but it was very problematic for people such as observers of the atmosphere and other meteorological phenomena, like the aurora that you see behind me in this virtual background. So 
when people were trying to measure uh, the atmosphere or the aurora at that time, they used measurements that were all taken at the same local solar time. That word should be at in that sentence. But Cleveland Abbey, who was the head of the US Weather Service in 1870s, was trying to do an experiment where he would get sim uh, simultaneous observations of the aurora. And due to this problem that everybody was using a different time scale, the aurora happens quickly. It's not a very, it's not a uh, hours long phenomenon. It's a few minutes or maybe more. So he tried to do this kind of simultaneous observation and just could not make sense of it because everyone was measuring things given, using a different uh, standard of, of, of uh, time. So he began to push for the measurements at, taken at the same moment on a sort of universal system. And the railroads were also beginning to do that around this time because they covered large distances from east to west and they therefore needed to have measurements of uh, 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 signals for simultaneous time so that trains, which ran on a single track at that point, going both directions, so that these trains would not run into each other. <laughs> Everyone needed to know exactly what time it was relative to every other train, and that implied a universal system. So the Weather Service and the railroads in this country teamed up to bring us standard time. The, time, the kind of time that we live with today. And when this happened, um, you can see here, by the way, I mean, this is the Transcontinental Railroad down at the bottom, and you can see the telegraph line run, running along it. The telegraph lines were always laid next to the railroad because the, A, the railroads needed them, and B, they already controlled the right of way so they could build them. So they used the telegraph system to telegraph time signals and other information to people up or down the line. When railroad time became a standard, uh, it was mocked in the press. Here, you know, people will have to marry by railroad time, die by railroad time, preach by railroad time, banks open and close by railroad time, and so on. But that is, in fact, the world we live in today. And you can see here, at the uh, Meteorological US Weather Service in 1880, many telegraph wires coming out of the building used to telegraph all kinds of weather information to other uh, weather stations. With respect to meteorology, uh, the introduction of daylight saving time was another confusing thing because at the time it was introduced in 1917 in the UK, uh, it was the, there, there was a long period when the observers were kind of not understanding what was going on. And some of them were using daylight saving time and some of them were not. And the uh, part of what that meant was that observations that depended on simultaneous time just got completely screwed up for about a four month period there until they really understood the standardization system. So here's what things look like today. You know, you all know about time zones. I'm out here on the West Coast and you're in the central time zone. But if you look at the, this map, you see that of course, only in the middle of a time zone or some, some arbitrary point in the time zone is it actually solar noon. So all of these uh, white marks here, very narrow bands, are the, are the places where in a given time zone it's actually, you know, corresponds to solar time. And otherwise, you're either ahead or behind. China is quite strange because it only uses one time zone and it's got an enormous uh, east-west dimension. And so people there are all using the same time but people here, way out here in the western part of China are at really on a completely different solar schedule than people in the eastern part. So before I move on to my next segment here, anybody have questions about time? And uh, just as an FYI, um... So students, uh, as we've done before, you wanna, if you wanna put your questions in the chat, we can, um, we can uh, 
you know, we can share them that way. Just let us know. Okay, we have one question uh, from Zev actually, who wants to know if that that time ball is the origin of the New Year's Eve ball drop. Oh, I was yes. kind of wondering about that too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what that is. Wow, who knew? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll move on. And there'll be another point in uh, a few minutes when you have another chance. All right, so let me talk about what we know about climate and do it with this kind of temporal zoom lens. And part of the point of doing this is to really show you how the scales of time matter to so much to what we think about climate and climate change. You know, we live day to day and year to year, but climate is a much longer uh, scale phenomenon. You know, usually with respect to meteorology, people are talking about a 30 year average uh, and it could be much, much longer if we get into deep time. So here, if we look at the uh, carbon dioxide concentrations here and Antarctic temperatures down below, over the last 800,000 years, you can see that the, the uh, carbon dioxide concentrations have gone up and down, and right along with them, temperature in Antarctica has also gone up and down. That's obviously related. Carbon dioxide is the, one of the major factors in climate change, even natural climate change. And we, what part of what we see is that during that period, the, the concentrations of carbon dioxide have gone from about 175 to about 275 parts per million. And they've stayed in that range the entire time. Meanwhile, the temperature has been, this zero line is our current um, uh, average temperature. And most of the time in this period, the, it's been colder than it is today. So what we're seeing here are ice ages coming at, with, as, as the carbon dioxide concentration drops, the temperature falls, and then as, it, as the temperature goes back up, the con carbon dioxide concentration goes back up too. Now, this is a species level time scale. So genetically modern humans, our species, Homo sapiens sapiens, emerged around 200,000 years ago so most of this period, it has actually been colder than today. Now, if we zoom in to a 100,000 year time scale, down here, this is a proxy measure of temperature and oxygen isotope in, uh, from ice, taken from ice cores. And we see that it's been below modern levels almost all of this time until we get to the interglacial period we're in now, the Holocene. And that's, this is the whole history of our species moving out of Africa, going to Australia and South Asia and Europe. And then the beginning of agriculture, which seems very distant to us today on our human time scale, is way up here. And notice also that this Holocene period, temperature has been very stable relative to the past and also as well as warmer. So now zooming in another power of 10 to about a, the last 11,000 years. Here we have the, you know, the, the, this is, these are model reconstructions based on some data about paleoclimate. This is the average temperature of this whole period, the Holocene, the interglacial. Here is the average over the last century or so. Here is the average over the last 10 years. And 2016, the warmest year we have on record, way up here outside almost all error bars for any of these measurements. If we zoom in again, another power of 10 to the last 2000 years, you know, last 1000, here, we see that there were two periods uh, of change, the so-called medieval warm period around AD 1000 or 1100, and then the Little Ice Age in the uh, 17th, 17th century and 18th century. And then since then, 
a dramatic rise in temperature higher than any point in this period. And finally, on a, a scale much closer to the present, um, I meant to put the 100 year scale in here, but it's not there. The, the last July was the hottest month ever recorded. 2019 was the second hottest year ever recorded. And 2019 was the hottest, and the, the last decade was the hottest decade ever recorded. So these time scales really matter to us. And uh, now I want to think about those scales in relation to the time scales of infrastructure. So this concept comes from Stuart Brand's book, The Long Now. Uh, it's a fascinating idea. One of the things you may not have noticed at the beginning when I put up the date, I put a, an extra zero in front of it. This is uh, Brand's way of thinking about th the sort of present we really need to imagine as being much longer than a century or even a millennium, but out to 20,000 years, that's the length of time between, so 10,000 years is the length of time between the dawn of agriculture and the present. So he's saying, why don't we think about what the next 10,000 years as being relevant to the history of our species? We have some remnants of infrastructure, Stonehenge, the pyramids in Giza, the Roman Empire, uh, the ancient cities of Greece, but most of them are really from the last 6,000 years or so. So Brand, one of Brand's projects is to build a clock that would measure time on that scale and keep continuous time without needing to be recharged or uh, sort of spun up all the time. The chimes would ring every century instead of every day or every year. So they're actually building this thing. It's an enormous project in a mountain in Nevada. And this is a concept for how it might look. Here's today's date as we might, might express it in Brand's terms, the clock of the long now. And so we have before the common era, BC and after and the common era of CE. Now let's relate that to the kinds of infrastructures we're living in today, which really exist on hundred year time scales, century time scales. If we look back at the United States, which is late to this game, you know, China, the Roman empire, uh, the Egyptian pyramids and those things are back there too. Roman roads are in use throughout Europe, ones that were built originally for, you know, during the Roman period. But just looking at the, the United States, we see canals being built. Sorry about that. Every time I move my mouse, things happen in PowerPoint. Canals being built, railways, telegraphs, roads, oil pipelines, airways. We could extend that list. What we see here is this is a, a graph that's based on you know, when they started building them through when the system was more or less built out and didn't change much anymore. And you see that the period of that is on the order of half a century to a century. Energy sources also have changed on, over the last couple of centuries on that sort of time frame. By, you know, in 1830, almost all the energy the human species used was renewable because it was biomass. It was wood or other biofuels that were burned. Coal comes in in a big way around 1900, uh, around 1800, and starts to really become major source of energy. So it's half the energy that we're using globally in around uh, around the time of World War One, and then oil and natural gas. Way down here are you know nuclear and other kinds of renewables starting to pick up steam now. So these things all require coal, oil, you know, everything except wood and biomass require massive infrastructures for them to be mined, distributed, burned to make other kinds of energy like electricity and so on. And that in turn implies a kind of temporal commitment. 
And that's really what, what the heart of what I want to get across to you today is that the stuff that we have built in the past has committed us to a future that we no longer want, but the fact that it is expensive and that it took so long to build and that we have all grown up with it and really don't have another way yet has left us in this terrible position of seeing a future we none of us want to want to have of, of radical climate change. And yet we have this commitment that's been developed over many years. So again, that temporality of construction. If we think about things like fossil fuel infrastructure, which has a, you know, everything we build eventually wears out. So you know, mines, refineries, pipelines, tankers, all these things eventually have to be replaced. And that process takes between 30 and 50 years. But the cost of it, the entire system all over the world is somewhere on the order of $10 trillion, which is about a year of uh, United States GDP. If we spent all our money on another infrastructure at that scale, maybe we could replace it all with renewables in a year, but that's a very big ask. So during this period, the last couple of centuries, when we've been building all that stuff, carbon dioxide has been going into the atmosphere from the fossil fuels that we burn. That concentration has gone from the, uh, you know, uh, uh, to 250 to 270 parts per million, all the way up to over 410 parts per million today. This really interesting study was done in 2010 where the people who did this asked the question, what would happen if we just stopped today um, with the, the infrastructure that we have? But we, we keep using it, but we don't replace it when it wears out. So we let all the, all the gas powered cars go, all the power plants that burn oil and gas and coal, let them keep going until they're too worn out to use anymore and then abandon them. And the amazing thing about that is that if we could do that, this was back in 2010 and we've had another 10 years since then, but if we could do that, according to their study, we would have no trouble meeting the uh, the, the temperature targets set out by the IPCC. So the point here is that a lot of the emissions that will happen in the future will come from things that we haven't built yet or things that we build simply to replace and continue the pattern, to continue following the path that we already laid down. This is an example of that path. You know, we have built freeways, we've built cities designed around freeways. They commit us not only to the lifestyles that, that uh, we live, but to certain systems of energy supply, to ways of getting around, to a need to travel far from our homes in order to work, and all the other things that go with that. So, the next slide I'm going to show is the rising temperature of the planet, but I want, I want you to look at this not just as temperature, but as the output of that infrastructure. So what you are watching here is the development of fossil fuel powered infrastructure all over the world. That's where most of the, the carbon dioxide comes from. It's the source of our biggest problems. And as you can see, it's getting steadily worse and worse. So now we'll take another pause. Questions? Or comments? I want to give um, our students a chance to weigh in here. Any questions from, from them? The GIF we just saw, were those temperature changes relative to the previous year increases of one, two or three degrees or some other baseline or? 
their five-year moving averages and the baseline is the 1951 to 1980 average. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So now let's look at some of the risks we're facing due to climate change and how they relate to infrastructure time. So these are, the po these are some possible climate futures. Uh, this is a pretty technical graph in a lot of ways. I'm not gonna try to explain it deeply, but what you really need to know is that here on the left, we have a very radical path of reducing uh, to zero carbon emissions by 2030 which would maybe, maybe keep us at about one and a half degrees of warming. Uh, we are not on that path. Here is the business as usual path where we just keep on doing what we have been doing for the last two centuries and increasing our carbon output at the same rate. And this is a terrifying path because it takes us to four degrees centigrade by the end of this century. Here in the middle, you know, where we are actually going right now is somewhere between this in the middle and this on the right. Uh, the Paris Climate Agreements committed us to a future in which we will probably exceed two degrees centigrade, but maybe keep it below three. Uh, the, the principle of the Paris Agreement has been that we, the nations would try to uh, ratchet up their commitments as time goes on. You may not realize this, but the Paris Agreement in 2015 only came into effect this year. So the next cycle is five years out from now when we take stock of what has happened in the last five years and try to get nations to renew their commitments and, and add more to them. But we are, you know, if the commitments that have been made so far were carried out exactly as planned, which is extremely unlikely, uh, we might maybe keep things to two and a half or three degrees. What does that really mean? Well, so here's a, a, a one example. Water moves around the planet with climate. It's, you know, humidity is one of the things that's transferred as the atmosphere moves. And in general, what's likely to happen is that dry places get drier and wet places get wetter. It's not the same everywhere and you really have to look deep into the modeling to find what's most likely to happen to you. But you may have seen a paper that just came out the last few days about mega droughts that says that the American Southwest, including where I live in California, uh, appears to be entering a period that's like the two previous mega droughts in uh, the last two millennia. Uh, one which caused the, the vanishing of the Anasazi Indian civilization that lived in Arizona and Utah, and another that happened later that also caused uh, terrible um, dislocation and starvation for people living in that region then. So if that's true, uh, that's really a, you know, a serious problem. And it's not just about water because it's also about fire and places that have forest but become very dry like California uh, are already suffering more fire, faster fire, uh, fire with less ability to uh, come back from it than they did in the past. You know, the opposite problem happens of flooding and, and serious, um, agricultural disruption can occur when there's too much rain. Here's an event that occurred in 2015. So this is something that's already happened. Uh, you, you see that the temperature is 48 degrees centigrade during this heat wave in the Middle East. But here in Kuwait, the top of the scale is 52 degrees centigrade. And there were areas here where it was 50 degrees centigrade, 122 Fahrenheit. That only lasted a few days, 
But in the future, modeling anticipates that by 2100, heat waves like that could last three weeks and the high temperatures could be as high as 65 centigrade. That is approaching the temperature of a sauna. You cannot survive that without shelter. So anyone who's trying to work outdoors in those temperatures, that just will not be on during that period. It's questionable whether regions like that would be inhabitable at all if heat like that becomes current. Similar thing in a much more humid place, the Indian subcontinent. So especially out here in the eastern side and up here in the northern parts, you have regions that are likely to reach 32, 33, 34 degrees centigrade um, for, for some period of time toward the end of this century. When it's very humid, uh, those temperatures can be lethal because you cannot get rid of your body heat by sweating. It doesn't evaporate. So a lower absolute temperature, but a higher wet, but, uh, sorry, a lower wet bulb temperature, but a higher temperature with respect to your body can be uh, extremely dangerous too. And so this is that business as usual scenario that I was talking about a minute ago, kind of probably not going to hit that, but could. Sea level rise. And here is where we really see the interaction of infrastructure time and climate change time. So that's the city of Shanghai. 27 million people live here. You look at the, you know, all these buildings and roads, concrete and steel, infrastructure everywhere that it, you have to have to have a city at all. And here's what that city looks like today. You can see there's a river here coming into the Yellow Sea. Here's what's probably going to happen to that if we reach three degrees centigrade. The entire city, nearly all of it, underwater. Similar place closer to home. This is Miami, where um, my daughter and her family live in Fort Lauderdale, uh, up the coast a little ways. Uh, they're already getting king tides uh, every month or two that flood Miami Beach, the downtown areas of Miami Beach. And just like Shanghai, South Florida at three degrees centigrade will be underwater. So these are things that are already happening that our infrastructures cannot survive. We have already seen property loss on the coast, on the east coast of the United States and the Gulf Coast. This is a study from a few years ago, but still already showed, um, you know, by 2017, you know, many billions of dollars, $16 billion in losses in property value along these coasts in places where sea water has intruded into the groundwater or the sea level has come up enough to threaten the foundations of buildings. And another risk is weather-related risk. There are lots of categories here, tornadoes and hurricanes and floods and droughts and other stuff like that. So here, these are just billion-dollar weather-related disasters of all kinds. And you can see that, you know, of course, they vary year to year. But over time, there's obviously a, tr a growing trend. And these values are adjusted for inflation. So this is not, you know, what it... This is not what it cost back in 1990. It's what it co would cost today if you were to have to deal with the same problem. So last chance for questions. And I, then I've just got a little bit more and I'll stop and we can talk more then. Are there any questions on this segment or anything else? I have a question I should have asked at the previous segment probably but I was wondering if we expect to see any appreciable difference in greenhouse gas emissions due to our changes in activity because of the coronavirus. Yeah, the, I, I just was looking at a paper about that today and the, you know, the current estimate is it's about 8% lower this year already, already than it was in previous years. And it may dip even more as time goes on. Um, but one of the interesting things about that is that you know, a lot of what that means is that individuals are traveling less. So we were doing a lot less driving than we were. 
there's some other things that have come down, you know, manufacturing and so on, but it's still only 8%. That's because we have so much, so many things like heating and cooling that don't stop when people are working at home. Uh, we need electricity for even for this Zoom meeting. So part of what that is telling us is that even a really radical change in uh, patterns of use, like the one that we're experiencing now, is not nearly enough. You know, we need to be at zero and actually below zero. We need to be sucking it out of the atmosphere to avoid the worst effects of climate change. But even in this crisis right now, we're only seeing about an 8% reduction. I only ask because I'm trying to optimistically see some fortuitous incidental benefits of the pandemic. I was wondering as a bit of a follow-up question, when was the last time we saw any decrease in the amount of greenhouse gas emissions? Is this, is this an opportunity for us, even a, even the small 8% decrease? Well, we saw a, a, a kind of a flattening of the curve for a few years uh, from about 2015 to 2017 or 2018. And then that started going back up again. So we have not seen a global actual dip in carbon output. And this year might be the first year we see that. Um, with, uh, and you know, different countries have different patterns, but uh, in general, we have not seen a, a, a serious reduction. I mean, one of the opportunities we have right now, and I think this is really, really important, especially with respect to politics, is to come back from this with the knowledge that, you know, we had we depended on science and modeling to find out things about the COVID crisis that really helped a lot of people survive. We have science and modeling about the climate crisis that is telling us what we need to do to survive and we should pay more attention. And we could take this moment to rebuild, to, to go for a Green New Deal infrastructure project that would shift us very quickly to more renewables and get away from the, the coal and oil that we've been burning. So there is that, that chance when we get back to normal. Can I pop in with a question? Of course. Hunter, hi. Hi, Paul. Um, uh, one thing that um, I, I haven't seen so far in this really interesting presentation is the costs of the infrastructure of the actual physical spaces we live in, um, like the big buildings of the big cities, mm -hmm. right? Which um, there's an enormous CO2 output in the building of a big building, mm -hmm. and it very often continues to, to output a lot. At the same time, high density living tends to be pretty efficient living. And so I'm wondering what you think uh, sort of the future of a high density living environment would have to be for there to be a physical infrastructure that isn't requiring just sort of building the buildings that are going to be yeah. such a demand. Well, let's see. Uh, there's a lot to say about that. And I'm not an expert on it. So you just have to take what I say with a grain of salt. You know, at, uh, I live in San Francisco and out my window, I can see a can see is platinum lead certified that recycles all its water so it has a uses less water per person than any building in San Francisco is the Salesforce tower it's a it's an amazing thing that they've done um, so it is possible to do a better job with this it doesn't account for the building part of building which is what we're talking about of course, one of the biggest things that's used in modern construction is concrete, which is absolutely terrible for climate. It's about 6% of all greenhouse gas emissions. Paul, oh, can, I, can I interrupt you for a second? Um, I feel like we've lost a little bit. We've lost your video and your sound has gotten a little wonky. Ah, okay, hang on. Oh, that's already, it sounds better. Okay. <laughs> Hang on. There we there go. you are. Okay, thanks. Right. Thanks a lot. Thanks. I didn't notice that. But, uh, so I was talking about concrete, which is about 6% of carbon emissions globally. It's terrible because it, you know, it's a breakdown of calcium carbonate limestone to make, make the, uh, 
make the material for, for concrete and the carbon is released into the atmosphere when you do that. But a great hopeful thing I've seen recently is that some people have developed a biological mode of making concrete that uses organisms to harden almost anything. You can use ground glass or uh, waste products, waste plastic, all kinds of things. And then this uh, biological substrate seals it all together and makes it just as hard and durable as concrete. And it actually absorbs carbon and continues to absorb carbon after it's built. So if that turns out to be scalable, uh, that would be a massively beneficial innovation. We still have steel, which is very energy intensive, but if we could get the concrete problem solved, that would be a really big step. We had um, uh, another couple of questions from uh, students here. This is uh, from Kenzie, and I'm just going to go ahead and read Kenzie's question, um, if, if that's OK. Um, she asks, uh, in your opinion, what is the most effective change we could make to our infrastructure in coastal cities to prevent further uh, property damage and ultimately injury and death? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. I mean, you know, in the long run, you just can't fight this. So there's going to have to be some retreat. And there are now, you know, depressingly, a whole series of conferences about managed retreat from the coastline to, to you know, try to back away from that and move people elsewhere where they, they will be able to, to handle it. You know, rich places might get away with seawalls for a while. The Dutch have done that for centuries and uh, you know, they'll probably make it through this too, at least for a while. But we're looking at, you know, in the, you know, what I see is the most likely future by 2100 of about a meter of sea level rise, maybe less, maybe two, two feet, something. But that's enough that the, you know, places that are very close to the coast will not be mostly, unless they're well protected with seawalls, they'll, people will just have to move back. So, you know, doing something about the underlying problem is the best thing you could do for coastal cities. But uh, assuming, uh, and part of the issue is that this is not just a problem of this century, but of many centuries to come. And as the atmosphere and the ocean come into equilibrium, we expect that by 2500, even if we stopped all carbon emissions tomorrow, we would still get a couple of meters or more of sea level rise. So this is just not something we can escape in the, in, on any kind of uh, human time scale. And then um, uh, the other question that we had was um, uh, from Natalie, who was curious to know what makes you say um, we're likely not to continue down the path of business as usual? <laughs> Uh, that, that is a hopeful guess, <laughs> but it's also based on the, you know, the increasing awareness of the climate change issues, especially that that's been displayed by your generation, the students here. Um, you know, we have seen massive new movements of people to, uh, to raise awareness of this issue and do something about it with the you know, the children's climate strikes, the Fridays for Future movement, the Extinction Rebellion in Europe. Uh, and there has been a lot of motion by some of the major uh, governments. You know, the, the European Union so far has done pretty well with that, Germany especially. Um, China has come a long way. It's still on a bad path, but it's, you know, it's on a much better path than it had been on in the current um, leaders of China seem to be very serious about that. So, you know, I do have some hope for the for the future. And I think that as, uh, you know, more and more weather related disasters hit us, the the pressure to act seriously and quickly will mount and that will bend that curve some. Okay, and we have uh, another question. This is from JC. It says, in terms of modeling, it seems that even among some, uh, you know, even, uh, sorry, given some uh, relative uncertainty of predictive models, there's substantial agreement among climate scientists about our future climate. If our infrastructures are ill-equipped to handle these changes, the answer would seem to lie in policy. So where do you think the disconnect lies between the models and the policy and how do we fix that? Yeah. 
a big question. <laughs> That's a great question and a really hard one. And, and the hard part of it has to do with time. I mean, you know, people are still building hotels on the Miami beachfront. It's crazy to me, but they do it because they can get uh, profits out of it pretty quickly. You know, even with awareness of the threat, you know, they can build a building and pull a lot of profit out of it in the next 20 or 30 years and get away, you know, so it's, so, I mean, I, I think not everyone who's building those skyscrapers really accepts that there will be this problem, but some of them do, and some of them are doing it anyway. It's, it's like the pattern that we established a long time ago of building in floodplains in this country. I mean, the, the entire Mississippi Valley, but especially the Delta area is built in a, you know, an, a place where terrible floods happen and they happened, what was it, one year ago, two years ago? massive Mississippi flood. Um, and this is related to the insurance industry. And here's a place where I think policy change could happen very quickly that would have a huge effect. So um, this is not a thing I have great memory for dates on, but there was a period maybe 15 or 20 years ago when the federal flood insurance program was voted out because of the risk it implies and the, the fact that the public was then stuck with the damages uh, caused by people building in floodplains. And that only lasted a couple of years because the flood insurance po program was so popular. So it's back. Now the federal government insures people in floodplains. If that were out of the picture and private insurance companies had to do this, and they were using catastrophe models that took into account climate change, which they are currently not allowed to do in some states, many states. Uh, if that all happened, then perhaps the cost of insurance by itself would begin to drive up, you know, to change property values in a way that reflected the risk. But right now we have this irrational system where we insure people uh, at public expense for risks that really they ought to be taking on their own. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have in the queue at the moment. Okay, now let's talk about the really long-term, what I'm calling eternal risks. Not really eternal, but they're eternal with respect to human timescales. And so here's, you know, the, the situation where if we manage to stop all greenhouse gas emissions tomorrow, zero emissions here, we would possibly, possibly, I mean, this was made in 2013 and the data in it were probably from around 2010 because of the literature lag. If we got to zero emissions, we might hold the global surface warming to really today about one degree. Because that was a decade ago and a lot has happened since then. What would happen to those greenhouse gases that were already in the atmosphere? Well, methane oxidizes pretty quickly. We go back to pre-industrial in about 50 years, nitrous oxides, Nitrous oxide would take about several centuries, but carbon dioxide, according to the IPCC, would essentially never come back to its pre-industrial level on any time scale relevant to us. That's why I say we, you know, even if we stop tomorrow, we can expect sea level rise to continue for centuries. So this is the phenomenon of the Anthropocene. We have messed with the planet on a geological time scale, on a geological scale, both uh, physically in terms of forces and uh, temporally in terms of time scales. The Anthropocene is a new geological epoch. If you hadn't heard this word, um, it's a often dated to the, tr the first atomic bomb test in Almogordo, New Mexico. So this is the first geological era that can be dated to a precise second, 529 in the morning. This is the bomb blast going off in Almogordo on, in 1945. Why that as a marker? 
because the radiation from that test, the radioactive debris, is still around and will be for millennia. Uh, all the other atomic testing that took place in the atmosphere left a layer of fallout radioactive debris all over the world that will still be detectable in thousands or even millions of years. So from a geological perspective, if you were a future geologist, say in 10 or 100,000 years, digging down through the layers, you could mark that moment in time in the, uh, the, the layers of rock below you. I'm going to talk about a couple other things that are coming up because it's not just climate change, it's other things we're doing to places we're sort of going past the limits of what the planet can support. One of them is phosphorus. So phosphorus is one ingredient of uh, fertilizer. It's uh, an element without which plants cannot photosynthesize. So it's the at the base of our food chain and because it's an element, we can't synthesize it. So the phosphorus we have is all the phosphorus we get. We have been digging it up and using it in artificial fertilizer. We've been doing it for a long time with guano natural fertilizer that's found in places where birds do a lot of pooping. Um, there's also much older fossil phosphorus from uh, previous eras buried in the rocks and we have been mining it. And the thing is, it's a relatively, there's a relatively limited amount of phosphorus in the whole planet. And what we tend to do with it is mine it up, spray it on crops or on, the, on the soil. They use it to make more food. And then the phosphorus is washed away, much of it, by rain. It goes into the rivers and into the oceans. And then on a human time scale, it is gone for good. You cannot get it back. So as we begin to mine out the last economically possible uh, phosphorus deposits, which is a, a date we're coming up on here projected for 2033, but it's, there's a lot of uncertainty around that, uh, that will become more and more expensive and eventually we will exhaust all of it. And we can still farm without artificial fertilizers, but the production levels will be much lower and it'll be more expensive. Nuclear waste. Now here we get into a truly eternal kind of risk because we generate colossal amounts of this stuff every year. We do not, still do not have a long-term waste disposal option for uh, the United States. And these things, the radioactive wastes we're producing last a long, long time. So a hundred years, a thousand years, 10,000 years, a hundred thousand years, even a million years for some of these things in which they would still be relatively risky. So that stuff, you know, we will find ways to bury it somewhere, but what do we do about the future? You know, civilizations coming behind us, you know, we're a brief blip in time relative to the Romans or the Egyptians or the Babylonian civilizations of the past. What will the future Romans or Egyptians or Babylonians find? And will we even be able, will they even know that we have left this stuff behind? The world is not always gonna look like it does now. So people have been thinking for a while about how you mark something dangerous for a future civilization that maybe cannot read your language, cannot read at all, has no, uh, you know, has a whole different way of communicating. And so there have been, you know, over a long period, these uh, kind of contests. This is a famous one known as the spike field, where you would just put these scary looking spikes all over the area around a radioactive waste, or diagrams like this that show, you know, people with uh, faces that, that, that look frightened or uh, disgusted and say, say to some future civilization that you should not drill here before AD 12,000, 10,000 years from now. 
So we're back to the 20th century's long now. And, you know, I call it the 20th century's long now because so much of what we're the threat that we're living with today was created in the 20th century and will still be with us many centuries from now. All that infrastructure, all of its outputs, the things that, you know, the plastic waste, the fertilizer that's been expended and can't be retrieved, all of that done in the 20th century, we're still doing it, but even if we come away from it, that century will still be with us in hundreds or thousands of years. So I'll leave you with this, the Anthropocene fingerprint, the way that we are have changed the planet that threatens our lifestyles, our infrastructure, and everything we hold dear. So I'll stop with the screen sharing now and we can uh, talk a bit more. I'm happy to answer more questions or take comments of any kind. Objections, <laughs> anger. <laughs> Actually, um, if I can jump in uh, with a question. So one thing we've talked a little bit about in the class are some proposals for sort of geoengineering projects. And, you know, we've looked at, uh, uh, we, we did a reading from Ben Sovacol who, you know, does, does a nice way of kind of laying out some advantages and disadvantages. From one of the charts you've shown, though, it really does look like um, actively working to get carbon out of the atmosphere is something we're probably going to have to consider. Is that true or, or no? Yeah, no, I, I think it's absolutely true. And, you, you know, the, most of the geoengineering schemes that we have would just mask the, the underlying warming in some way. And, you know, when I talk to people who are serious about that sort of policy, they usually say, you know, we would only do this to buy time to revive, you know, really change our infrastructure and bring the carbon output down. But the big danger of it, of course, is that if you can bring the planetary temperature down and that actually works, of which I'm rather skeptical, um, you might, you know, keep the climate system we have for a while, but you don't change the ocean acidification problem, the other carbon problem, which is already causing, you know, huge oxygen dead zones in the sea, uh, acidification that affects shellfish and other, you know, sea life. And we depend so much on that that it would still be a disaster. Uh, let's see. There was another thing I wanted to say about geoengineering, though. Sucking carbon out of the atmosphere, that's the question. So can we do that? Well, the answer is yes, and we have done it. Uh, there are existing uh, places where it's been done to, as, as part of drilling for oil, and places where it's been done to store carbon scrubbed out of power plant exhaust. Um, in Saskatchewan, there's a pretty well-functioning well experiment with that that's been going for a couple of years at this point. So it's possible, but the problem is scale. You know, the carbon storage option where you liquefy carbon dioxide and pump it underground, you know, even if you can do that without any risk, questionable, but maybe possible, uh, you have this issue that the, the, um, the, the, the geological features necessary to store it that way don't exist in most places. So then you start to get into pipelines, which are riskier than just storing it right underneath you and uh, refrigerating the gas and you know, there's a million other issues that come up. So storing it underground, you know, we can probably get some percentage of carbon dioxide out of our exhaust streams that way but that means we're still burning the fossil fuel, and that means particulates and all the things that come with them. So it's not the greatest option. As for removing it, and you know, other techniques for removing it, you know, the most popular thing is tree planting, and that's great. You know, I want to see everybody likes trees. Let's have more trees. I think that's a great idea. Unfortunately, there are issues with that too, and one of them is that as the climate warms. The trees that do well in the climates there they currently inhabit will no longer do well. So we may start to lose trees even, you know, at a rate even higher than we can plant them. And we need to somehow anticipate future climates for those trees that we plant 
so that we don't plant a species that's just going to grow up and then wither as the climate warms or it gets too dry or too wet. So technical means for removing carbon uh, wholesale, just you know, scrubbing it out. There are some ex interesting experiments going. I've seen absolutely nothing that doesn't that, that would be cheap enough and effective enough to go to come close to the scale that we need. But there's a career. <laughs> there are lots of careers for you people listening to this. Uh, getting finding ways to get carbon out of the atmosphere. Go for it. We, we want that. Um, so I have a I have a very similar follow up question, um, which is I'm I'm really struck by your idea that um, in terms of momentum, technological momentum and path dependence, that um, when we invest in infrastructures, we make temporal commitments. And you've you've talked about these temporal commitments as um, you know carrying certain risks. I wonder if I asked you to reflect on temporal commitments that maybe put us on a beneficial track. Mm -hmm. what what could you what could you envision for different kinds of investment in infrastructure yeah well you know of course thing number one is renewable energy systems and you know these are this is one place where we seem like we're maybe getting onto a path that will be not just beneficial in climate terms but also economically because mm -hmm. in most parts of the world now renewable sources wind and solar are cheaper than any other way of generating electricity. Now, you know, part of our problem is that we have a lot of things that don't run on electricity, like cars. So we have to get that whole piece of the infrastructure converted too. And then the grids that carry the electricity have to be converted. And that's not, a, not, not necessarily easy, but that's, that's a direction where we seem to be moving in the right direction. Now, if we came out of this crisis uh, buying out the oil companies so that they did not, you know, just leave that stuff in the ground, use that, invest only in new renewable sources and just stop with the fossil fuels. That could be an option. Coal is dying everywhere because it's too expensive. So that too is likely to uh, fade away in time, but there are still places where it's a really attractive option so the Chinese, as they're, they're doing massive projects in Africa, and they're doing a lot of that with coal they can find there. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's really unfortunate since they're doing pretty well at home, but they're doing less well where they're in the places that they're currently colonizing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Suzanne, can I uh, jump in? Absolutely. Um, so I'm thinking about the idea of a, a kind of uh, inertia or maybe momentum is the better uh, word, maybe inertia. Um, so infrastructure, something like a, you know, made out of concrete or steel or whatever has a, a kind of material inertia, it just sort of carries forward and it's, it's it, you know, it would require a whole lot to get rid of it. You can't just sort of erase it and then, you know, something new pops up uh, instantly. Um, but I'm wondering if there's a, 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 a different kind of inertia that we need to uh, think about as well, which is a kind of social or economic inertia so that the infrastructure is the product of, you know, decisions by people who are in the social and economic world and they, you know, they make choices for uh, reasons that they have to, uh, to, you know, put all that steel and concrete in some place. The structure of incentive and reward that uh, motivate those kinds of decisions. Presumably that structure has a kind of momentum or inertia as well. And so the idea of transforming the infrastructure, kind of re reorganize the, uh, reorganizing the infrastructure in ways that would make less demand on, uh, on the, f on, or be less harmful to the future in the ways that we've described. Um, well, there's there's kind of an obstacle, or I, I guess I'm reaching towards the idea. There's kind of a social or an economic obstacle uh, uh, to that. There's that social or economic inertia, and so I I just wonder whether you could kind of reflect on that, and or just say is is that a reasonable way of thinking about this stuff as well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, the, at the highest level, part of what you have is very wealthy corporations that have a lot of influence on policy. 
And, you know, the oil industry and the fossil fuel industry generally is subsidized by the government that way with tax breaks, especially for exploring new resources. Um, so, you know, they continue to do that. And, you know, if we could remove those subsidies, it would become more expensive for them to proceed and they would uh, maybe move in a different direction. Um, at the level of individuals, <laughs> I want to really recommend that everybody go watch the ad that Audi played for its new electric car during the Super Bowl. It's brilliant because it what it shows is someone driving this electric car and she's driving through scenes where you have, you know, people at gas stations waiting in line to pump gas, you have smoke pouring out of exhaust pipes. Um, Lots of things like that. And then this that song, Let It Go from Frozen, begins to play. <laughs> so it's a it's a beautiful moment in this ad because what it suggests is that you know that this commitment that we've all made to that fossil fuel infrastructure is something that we could kind of emotionally release. You just let go of it and move to a whole other way of thinking. And I think if you know, if that kind of way of looking at how we uh, invest not just our, you know, our money and our material resources, but our, our, uh, you know, our mindsets, um, if that if that way were to to spread, so that we could make some of those choices seem a lot easier and more beneficial to individuals, that could happen. And we actually have a moment right now when we're, uh, some people were talking about that as a possible outcome of the COVID crisis because people in New York City and Los Angeles and lots of other very smoggy places are seeing clear blue skies that they have not seen <laughs> in many decades. And they may uh, decide afterward that, you know, that was really nice. I think I'll contribute to uh, making a a cleaner place to live. Yeah, we have um, a question uh, from Christina, and I'm just going to uh, go ahead and ask the question for Christina, where she, she asks, um, do you think the recent oil price drops that, that COVID has indirectly caused may provide a good starting point for buying out fossil fuel companies? Well, they sure could. <laughs> Those companies are suddenly worth a lot less, but you know the, the problem is that they, they, from their point of view, all they need to do is wait it out, and the demand will come back, and maybe even come back stronger because there would, you know, there will be a need for, you know, making up for lost time as in the, the aftermath of this crisis. But it's certainly a moment when you know we could see some oil companies fail, uh, and not, you know, just let's move on let's move to other things so i you know i think there is a i see a lot of twitter traffic about this i don't know if there's a lot of political traffic and there's certainly not a lot of political traction at this very moment but if uh in you know if, if things go the way i hope they will in january next year maybe we'll be on a different path and we can start to move in that direction Oh, um, we have a follow-up now uh, from um, Nishit, and this will be our, our last uh, question. Uh, on a, uh, he asks, um, would it be wise for the Fed to bail out the companies to prevent the economic shock, or can the transition to renewables be quick enough to prevent the shock? Ooh. Well, look, we're still going to be burning oil. There's no question about that. You know, you, the, the part of what I've been talking about is the, you know, the time scale for changing over to other systems is just too long for us to just suddenly do without. Um, so should the Fed do that? I don't know. Um, that's not, I, I just, I plead incompetence. I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, you know, we need to have a functioning economy to go anywhere after this is over. And we're already looking at some major disasters. Uh, you know, I would certainly be happy if they, there were conditions placed on a, a bailout like that, that, that forced the, those companies to move in other directions for their future. You know, I, I would really like to see the oil companies just rebrand themselves as energy full stop and think of a portfolio that is increasingly renewable and decreasingly fossil based. 
So maybe that's an option. Okay, well, it's um, just about 2.46 right now. So I know that uh, some students may have some other classes and things to turn to. So um, I'd just like to say uh, thank you to Paul. It was re a real pleasure. And I wish I could have been there with you in person. I hate doing this to people I can't see, but I hope <laughs> it was worth it for you. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Bye, everybody.